You know, the Apostle Paul never had sound system problems. <laughs> they said that George Whitfield uh, could preach to a crowd of thousands and people could hear him a mile away without a microphone. Just God amplified his voice. Benjamin Franklin said it was so loud he would get clear to the back of the crowd because he couldn't get too close because it hurt his ears. Because God had a way to reach God's people. And you know, I am grateful to today for the, for the technology that we do have. We have the greatest opportunity to minister this gospel through, through this live streaming, through all the social media. And, and a lot of you don't know, but Carly, uh, what, what is it you're doing? Is a social media thing? Mm -hmm. She does a social media. I don't know all this stuff. I have to have my grandkids tell me how to run my telephone. It's a cell phone, not a telephone anymore. <laughs> dates me. And, uh, but it's amazing. We're reaching more and more people. And, and I think Mike was telling me a, a week or so ago, a couple of weeks, they're doing like one-minute blogs. And, and, and they go through hours of my preaching and pick out one minute of something good I said out of all those hours. Think about that. <laughs> But I think as a week or two ago, there was over a thousand and some people who viewed that little one minute thing. Over 3,000. 3,000. 3,000. Bigger than I thought. Thank you. Praise God. Awesome. Think about that. You can sit right here and just reach 3,000 people. And I have one minute of good things to say. So listen carefully today. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait for this one minute moment. It's coming. <laughs> the Lord's put on my heart. It's kind of interesting. Um, a week ago, when we, got, well, when we got back from California, we was out with the, but, Butch and Julianne. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. And um, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he gave me the message for one, two, three, the next four Sundays and Wednesday nights. And uh, this Wednesday night, I'm going to talk about how to have your mind discover new things. You know, we can have a mindset that doesn't want to discover something new. And people with mindsets have always re, uh, rejected new things. You know, uh, uh, they didn't think that you could have a light bulb. They didn't think you could have a telephone. They didn't think you could have a car. You didn't think man could fly because of a mindset. And what the Lord wants us as God's people to have a mindset for heaven. But we have to open our mind to new discoveries from God. So we can't be closed-minded. This morning I want to talk about what a life looks like that's hidden in Christ. What does it look like to be hidden in Christ? And uh, so I want Colossians chapter 3. This is an encouragement from Paul. He says... If then, and if then can be translated this way, since you are really seated with Christ. It's not if you are, but you really are. Since you have been seated, raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And the scripture tells us that we've been raised and we've been seated at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. And by the Spirit of God, we are in Him in heaven, and He is in us on earth. That's awesome. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. I want to show you something about this. The Holy Spirit came and did two works of grace when we got saved. And I know you've all heard me say this, but sometimes we don't hear something, then we finally hear it. 
It's amazing to me, people that are here at the Shepherd's House, sometimes I'll, they'll come to me and they've, they've just got a new book or got something and they said, man, look, at this is so powerful. I never heard this before. And I just want to say, hmm, I've preached that many times. Where were you? <laughs> but God has different ways to reach you. And I was just glad they heard what I had been saying through a book because that really ministered to them. So there should be no competition in the body of Christ. But we should just be grateful that people get it. Amen. <laughs> and they're not all going to get it through me. I can tell you that right now. But they're going to get it through us as a body. Each one of us giving who we are in Christ. And you may be able to speak somebody that I never will. And that's the good news of the body of Christ. But when the Holy Spirit came, I always like to say this, it thrills me. He killed you. He killed the old man. He put him on the cross. He's dead. D-E-A-D, dead. And God doesn't recognize him anymore. He doesn't listen to him. The old man has absolutely no value to God. He's dead. But the second thing the Holy Spirit did was raised up the new man. Made in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So my new spirit, your new spirit, only knows God. Only knows God. The old man that's dead uh, no longer exists. The only thing that exists of him is memories. Hurts in the soul man that you did. It is true. You've had hurts. You've had trauma. But when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ out of the new man, then it heals you from what the old man did. Because he's dead. And one of the things the Lord has spoke to my heart, he said, I want you to introduce my people to themselves. To the real you. To show you who you really are. And to show them how much I love them. Because God is love. And uh, he, God's not mad at any of us. He's not going to be mad at you. He put all that on the Lord. And you say, well, I already know that. Do you really? We're going to find out. Because we're going to talk about, is your life really hidden in Christ? And it is. By faith. By grace. By grace and faith, we've been seated at the right hand of God. That's already a real situation. We have been raised with him, but we've got to begin to set our mind on that. Begin to, by the word of God and uh, by the book of Revelation, you want to get some glimpses of heaven, read Revelation. Not about all the things that's coming on the earth, but read about how the, the, the angels that cry, holy, 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 the seraphims that fly around the throne and the, the beautiful glass to see and all this. And also, I'll bet there's people in here who God has given you a glimpse of heaven. How many of sometimes, look at you. The Lord has just opened something up and you saw heaven. So, so God can personally reveal heaven to us. I've been to heaven many times. And uh, because God just, I, I, but see, you're not seeking heaven. You're seeking a face, the face of Jesus Christ. You're seeking a person. Because it says, we give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he calls us to seek his face. And when we do that, we get to see him. And the scriptural principle is this. The more we see him, the more we will be like him. We will be like him, church. That's our destiny. That's our future. Our future is to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, the old man is dead. He cannot do anything. He's dead. And a lot of ministers, and here's what you people, when you go out and minister to people, don't ever minister soul to soul. Their soul's dead. Your soul's dead. Your new soul being renewed, you've got to minister spirit to spirit. You've got to minister to your, each other's people's spirit. And a lot of pastors that teach law is trying to get the soul to do what it can't do. There's no way my old man can be like Jesus. It's impossible. But my new man is already like him. Wall to wall Jesus only knows God. Listen, your spirit and my spirit doesn't know anything of the world. Because my spirit and your spirit is not worldly. 
is seated with Christ in heavenly places. So out of my spirit, I can seek his face. And then I can gauge my mind and my affections in agreement with that and, and set my mind. You're going to hear a lot of the passion, the passion of your heart. Because everyone in this room, every human being, follows the passion of your heart. That's why it says in, in the Proverbs that uh, guard your heart above all things, for out of it are the issues of life. Where your heart is, your treasure is. And so if I set my affection on things above, because look, I have died to the world. The old man is dead. But if my affections are for the world, I will be a worldly, carnal Christian. Going to heaven, loved of God, no, that's not a problem. But the thing is, I'll be more in tune with the world than I am with the real kingdom that I'm really of now. I'll be more worldly minded than kingdom minded. We have a choice. I've always thought about this, Lord, why didn't you just zap us, you know? But then there would, develop, no be, would not be relationship. He didn't make us a bunch of uh, androids or droids or, you know, whatever they are. He made us have relationship with him, and that's by choice. That's by an act of our will. Because he wants a relationship with us. The old man has no relationship with God, does not want to have a relationship with God. The Bible says, Jesus, or Paul said, indeed, the old man cannot serve God. Not that he won't, he cannot, because he's dead. But my new man is alive unto God in Christ Jesus, being created after his image and likeness. Therefore, out of my spirit, it has to filter through the passion of my heart. I'm convinced our will is not in our soul, it's not in our spirit, it's in our heart. Because if the will, if my will is in my soul, the old soul man, I would never serve God. And if my will is in my spirit, that's all I would do is serve God. But the heart's the connector between here and here. Where's your heart? And this says set your affection, one scripture does say, set your heart on things above. Set the affections of your heart, your mind, on things above. Because that's where our home is. And when you begin to do that, we begin to see the world from his perspective. It's a lot easier when you look from up there and you see the world down here is pretty small. I was in my office one day and I have a globe in my office. And the Lord said, put that down there in front of your chair. So I did that. He said, now put your feet on it. So I just put my feet on it like a footstool. He said, the earth is my footstool. He said, that's how small the earth is to me. He said, is there anything impossible to me? No, Lord. He said, if you'll only believe and have a passion for me only, I can accomplish through your life everything I want to accomplish. So there you go. So I have to set my affections. I really do. I, every day I get up and seek the face of Jesus. By choice. By design. Because it's not automatic. Because the world has so much going on. Our jobs, our things that we're doing, and there's so much going on that we don't take that time to do the most important thing like Mary did, set at the feet of Jesus, and then get up and serve. And if we don't get quiet, a lot of ministries burn out. A lot of ministries burn out because they're so focused on the ministry instead of Jesus. And when you get focused on Jesus, the ministry's easy. It's just hallelujah. That's why I'm 72 years old. I'm just a happy camper. And Dorothy and I will be able to travel to all these countries. Can you imagine that? Do you know what it's like lugging two suitcases through airport after airport? That takes a lot of strength to do that. And, um, but God, something happens to us when we get out of it. We, when we go places, we just, there's a supernatural. We just get strong. I can't explain it. And, but it's, it's the grace of God. Because we seek Jesus. When you seek the face of Jesus, he'll reveal himself to you. He's not trying to hide. But he's trying to get you to be hidden in him. That your life is hidden with Christ in God. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter. Put to death, therefore, that which is earthly in you. How do you do that? Seeking his face. 
letting the grace of God do this. Don't, not on th- it says, therefore, put to death what's earthy in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices. And you've put on the new nature, which has been renewed in the knowledge after the image of the Creator. Here there cannot be Greek, or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, slave, free man, but Christ is all in all. Put on then, here's what we do, we put on, by faith, put on as God's children, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Church, this is who you are. You are God's chosen ones. You are, you are holy and you are beloved. Man, that's powerful. See, holy, the word holy means dedicated to God for righteousness. Not just, well, you've got to be a certain way, but you will be a certain way because he's holy, we'll be holy. Grace doesn't ever give us a license to be anything except what Jesus wants us to be. You can't, you can't have, say, I'm, I'm full of grace and I go out there and do anything I want to do. That's not grace. That's stupidity. That's the flesh wanting its own way and, and putting grace on it. But when grace is on my life, the old man's dead. And the desires of the old man die. And my desires now are towards the Lord. Then grace can abound through my life, through humility. So then what do we do? We are holy. We are beloved of God. We're chosen of God. Here's what we put on. Compassion. Kindness. And people say, well, how do I put on the Lord? Are you compassionate? You'll know if you're wearing Jesus or not. You'll know if your life is hidden in him or not. Are you compassionate? Are you kind? Are you meek and lowly? And do you have patience? Do you, do you forbear each other in love? Do you forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you? So you also must forgive. These are are things that we can look at in reality, church, and say, you know what, man, I don't have much compassion. Well, you're not hidden in Christ in that area. I don't know. You know, I don't don't think I ever want to forgive that person. Well, your life's not hidden in Christ yet because the old man is the one that can't forgive. The new man's already forgave somebody before they ever did it. Because God, while we were yet sinners, died for us. It says, while we were yet sinners. It says, God so loved us that before the foundation of the world, he seated us in his heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you were forgiven before you were asked to be forgiven. So if the new nature is working in me, you're forgiven before you ever ask me to forgive you. Because I don't know what you've done. You say, that can't work. Yes, it does. Because it's the new man, not the old man. Now, the old man will struggle with it. Lord, I ain't going to forgive that person for what they did. That's the old man. The new man has already forgiven them. That's why it says when we put on Christ, we can forgive. It's something the new man does. So it's a yielding to the new man and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ by seeking the things that are above. And as we put on the Lord Jesus, forgiveness flows. The forgiveness flows. And it's supernatural. And all of a sudden it's like, wow. I, I, don't, I had a guy ask me forgiveness one time. He came to the church and he did a bunch of ugly stuff and left. A few years later he called me and he said, I want, I want to ask you to forgive me for what I did. He said, it was all about me. It was all about my flesh. And to be honest with you, I didn't remember what he did. <coughs> Until he reminded me. Then I said, brother, you were forgiven before you ever did that. Of course I forgive you. Set him free. I know the saying says, well, you can forgive, but you don't have to forget. That's the old man. You know, it's like Jesus said, I forgive you of your sin, but I ain't going to forget that you were a sinner. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is... I don't remember. I've removed your sin as far as east from the west. Not a part of my life anymore. 
what people did. I just love them. And that's the grace of God. That's the new man that's talking here. Now, and above all these things, put on love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The word rule there is umpire. Peace will be the umpire of your life, the peace that passes understanding. If, if you don't have peace on the inside, don't do it. Follow the peace because that's the umpire of your life. That's the Holy Spirit saying, yes or no. Don't have peace, don't do it. Have peace, do it. Let peace be the umpire of your life. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to in which you were called to one body, and be thankful. It's so powerful to be thankful. It's so awesome to be thankful. Grateful, thankful people. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word dwell in us. Teach and admonish one another in wisdom and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. That word thankful there is grace. King James does say grace. And it is grace. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's, that's what happens to us when we live a life that's hidden in Christ. And I want to do something here. I'm going to move this up. Dorothy said, I don't know what you're doing, but here's the deal. Okay. This is simple, but it's profound. I've learned in my life, see, Dorothy and I, when we first got married, we established something in our life. She gave me a card. It said, we have a pure and simple relationship. It says, I am pure and you are simple. It meant she's the pure one, I'm the simple one. So we have a pure and simple relationship. And um, so the Lord does make it simple for me. Uh, just, he just breaks it down and makes it so simple that if we allow him to do it, he does what only he can do. How many of you know you can't save yourself? You can't help yourself? You can't be like Jesus in yourself, no matter how hard you try? And believe me, I've tried real hard. And the harder I tried, the worse I got. Anybody do that? Yes. The thing I don't want to do, end up doing it, that's the old man. And I found a law in me that there, there is sin that's in that old nature that can't serve God. So what, who's going to deliver me? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. I'm set free from that old stuff. Whew, that old guy that just hated everybody, fighting all the time, drunk, all kinds of crazy people like, like I was. Some of you are your testimonies. Is, I could have a testimony too, but my testimony is on the wall back there. It's spelled J-E-S-U-S. Amen. I just know Jesus loves me. He's the one that saved me out of suicide and did all these things. Jesus is our everything. And when our life is hidden in him, in God, we look like him. What does a life that's hidden in Christ look like? Well, let's see here. I think this thing will be big enough. Keep covering you up, covering you up, covering you up, covering you up, covering you up. What do you see out there? Forget the side thing. I didn't have enough covered up. I'll cover it up. What do you see? Do you see the pulpit anymore? Is it still there? But it's hidden. So you don't see a pulpit. You see this beautiful white sheet. When our life is hidden in Christ, what we're doing is we see Christ. You're there, you're there but that's the new man that's there, not the old man. But the more our life is hidden in Christ, they see Christ. Now, we can... We can be like this. Stay. See it, little baby? Now, what do you see now? 
see, the, see more of the pulpit, but you still see that there's a covering there? That's a life that's partially hid in Christ. Still a whole lot of self-living. But if I seek Christ, and we're being changed from glory to glory, look what's happening. More and more of the old man's going away, and more and more of Christ is beginning to cover me. But see, we make that decision. God's already said our life is hid in him. God, according to his plan, we're already seated in heavenly places. That's why we're exhorted to seek those things that are above, where your life is hid with Christ in God. And the more we do that, the more this begins to happen to us. Look what's happening now. You notice that you're beginning to see less of self? That's called sanctification. I went to a seminary and we did a book this thick on, that thick on sanctification. And when I read it, I got through reading it, I had no idea what sanctification was. <laughs> it's just, are you kidding me? So the Holy Spirit made it simple. He said, here's what it is, son. He said, I take you by the hand... I walk you up to Jesus, and I say to you, when I'm through with you, you're going to be just like him. That's sanctification. The Holy Spirit conforming us to the image of Christ. For God has determined, predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And in that process of being changed, self has less and less a voice. That's awesome. That is so simple, you'd have to not have a brain to miss it. Am I, am I, am I making sense? It's God doing all the work. It's God who purposed that in us before the foundation of the world. But there's a process that we yield to it. And here's the thing. I've been before the, the throne of Christ where every man's work is tried whether it's wood, hay, and stubble, which is flesh, or gold, precious stones, and silver and gold, which is the Spirit. And I was before the throne of grace, and I, I, there was Jesus right in front of me. And yeah, there was some wood, hay, and stubble that was kind of taken away, but then there was this precious stones, and Jesus took a, a, this precious fruit of righteousness in my life, where I obeyed him. He formed it into a crown, and he put it on a throne. Because you see, we are rewarded by our obedience and let Jesus be our life. It says every man's work will be tested. Though it be burned up by the fire, his spirit will be kept alive. I don't want anybody in this place to stand before the Lord and all you have is wood, hay, and stubble. You will be with the Lord forever, but there won't be no crown. Because God rewards us when we receive his faithfulness. When my heart is for Jesus more than anybody or anything. Then he rewards us with himself. The greatest reward we have is being one with our God. So even now, church, on this side of glory, we're being conformed to the image of Christ. And the more I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the less and less the flesh has its uh, way in my life. And I'm not worried. I don't worry about things. I'm not troubled. I'm not weary. The, the Lord told me years ago, he said, when your soul begins to be weary, he says, Psalms 23 says, that if we follow him, our soul is restored. If we take his yoke upon us, our soul is refreshed. And he said, if your soul, man, you're weary and you're tired, he said, you're not following me. I went that way. You're going this way. You've not taken my yoke upon me, you. You've yoked yourself with your own strength. So whenever that happens in my life, I stop. And Dorothy attests to this in the staff. I will go in my office and shut the door. I may, be, I may not be around anybody for days. Because I have to get back with the face of Jesus so that whew, peace comes back to my soul. 
That's why I can be here at 72 years and more excited about Jesus because he's my life. He really is. And he lets me know what part of my life he's not getting control of. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good process. Let me tell you something. In growing with the Lord, be grateful when God says, this part of your life is, I've got to deal with it. But I don't want you to deal with it, Lord. I like this Ishmael. Well, I don't. It's hindering you. It's hindering you from being my, letting my spirit make you into the image of my son. And then, then I have a choice to make, Lord. Do I want to hang on to what my soul wants or do I let it go to Christ and then get renewed in that area? I used to be so depressed. It's like that old uh, hee-haw. If it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. I kind of lived that way for a long time. And the Lord finally says, son, that's not pleasing to me. You can't fulfill everything on your life if you let that dominate your life. Man, I, I mean, I just won't go through the whole story, but God set me free. Started way back when I was a boy, and then when I tried to commit suicide. God set me free. So you can't get me depressed no more because I'm not going to let him come to the table, the old man. He's not going to come and eat with me like I think Carly said that. Uh, just don't provide a place for the old man at your table. So I'm growing in Jesus, and, and all of a sudden, there's more and more of Christ, because my life is hid in Him. So what is people going to be seeing? They're going to be seeing more of Him. That's not difficult, is it? And finally, this will happen to us. Now, when we get before the Lord, this, this is our ultimate position in Christ. And the thing about heaven is the old man doesn't go there. So a lot of Christians won't know themselves because they never got acquainted with who they really are. But when you get to heaven, it's like a microwave because there's nothing to resist God because the old man doesn't go there. So this will be our ultimate position. As he is, so are we. The day will come when we totally look like Jesus. That's awesome. But church, we can do it now. Don't wait till you get to heaven. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him, you know, let him begin to cover you. Because a life that's hidden in Christ will look like Jesus. Jesus' life was hidden in the Father. And he said, Philip, if you've seen the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Christ's life was hidden in the Father. And now we're hidden in Christ in the Father with him so that this is what we want the world to see. Because I don't want anybody in this room to stand before the Lord and be ashamed because the world meant more to them than he did. That's not a good place to be, church. Because your ultimate destiny in Christ is in you and he has a plan and purpose for you on this life and I'll tell you right now if you don't answer the call of God it's not you it's the thousands or hundreds of people that God wanted you to reach it's those who he wanted you to present Christ to Elijah only you know Elijah only did one third of what God told him to do When he got through with this, you know, pity party and the Lord came to him, he says, here's three things. I want you to go anoint Elisha. I want you to anoint, I think, the king Agib. And I want you to go anoint Jehu. Elisha on, Elijah only anointed Elisha. One third. The first thing that Elisha did when Elijah went to heaven was he anointed Jehu and he anointed king Je Agib. So he apparently, Elisha told Elisha, Elijah told Elisha the three things that God told him to do. So here's the point I'm making. I don't want any in this room to do only one third of what God told you to do. Because watch what happened. If God, if Elijah would have anointed Jehu, what did Jehu do? Jehu do? He went and killed Jezebel. Well, because Elijah didn't obey, 
17 years from the time he had anointed Elisha, 17 years later, he was translated into heaven. And for 17 more years, Jezebel ruled with her cruelty. So people were subject to 17 more years of Jezebel's rule because of Elijah's disobedience. So people pay the price for me not putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he has a purpose for you that's bigger than you can imagine unless you stay in tune with him. Unless you let him cover you. Does that make sense? It's, it's, It's simple, but it's so profound, church. And I just want you to encourage you to seek his face. He's not trying to hide from you. He wants you to be hidden with him in the Father. And a life that's hidden in Christ will begin to look more and more like him, begin to reflect more of him, to be more like him in every way, every area of your life, so that when people see you, when they're around you, they experience Jesus. They know that this is somebody that's been with the Lord. The greatest privilege you'll ever have when someone comes up to you and say, you remind me of Jesus. And I know Christians like, oh, oh, it's not me. Well, it is and isn't. It is you because of your obedience to the Lord Jesus. That ought to be the highest compliment anybody could give you. Would you want them to come and say, you make me think of the devil? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. (laughs) When people come up to me and say, you remind me of Jesus, and they do it all the time, all over the world, I finally learn to say thank you. It's the greatest compliment you'll ever give me. It's the greatest compliment, church, you'll ever have if people come to you and say, you remind me of Jesus. Why? Because your life is hidden in him. That's proof that your life is hidden. So when you go and that little waitress has had a hard day, had to do a double shift, and she's throwing your plates at you, and you look at her and you smile and you love her. That's right. And you give her a big tip. Because you don't know what hell she just went through. That's right. And you may be the face of Jesus to help her come out of that you might be Jesus that goes through the Walmart line and that those people making hardly any money have a rough life and and the the line is backed up cash registers not or it's not a cash register anymore it dates me too not working and she's frustrated and people are getting mad then when you step up there You have a smile on your face. You have a love that flows through your eyes for this this person. And you smile at him and say, it's okay. It's okay. I'm not in a hurry. You know what it'll do to them? I've watched it. They just lighten up. Why? Because you just lifted all this frustration off of them. Because the person before you just reamed them out. God forbid that we would do that because of our little flesh. Well, I've been in this line for 15 minutes. We'll just stand in line and pray in tongues. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That works. That's my kids. I'd be walking through a store praying in tongues. They'd say, Dad, quit it. <laughs> I just want to encourage you, church, that you are so awesome. You are God's answer to the world. And the more your life is hid in him, the more of his life will flow through you. And you have no understanding how great of things he can do through your life. And I want everybody in this room to be able to, when you stand before the Lord, to hear him say, well done. Well done, thou faithful and good servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Because there's no joy on earth that can even compare 
to the joy of righteousness, peace, and joy by the Holy Ghost. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And, I, and I just want to say this. You, thank these young people, all of you on the healing team, Butch and, all of you, you have represented Jesus. Amen. And all of you are good friends. And you have represented Jesus. And all of you in this room, there are times you have represented Jesus. You have blessed Dorothy and I. There's been times in our life when we were struggling and you came alongside of us and lifted us and helped us. We need each other. So that as a corporate body, we can be hid in there. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Well, has this blessed you? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> so anyway, guys, this has been an amazing week. A lot of more has been imparted than you can imagine. But it's also you've sown a seed for your future. And great things are going to happen with all of us. And so um, I just want to say a special thanks to this couple here, this Mr. Steve and Lori. And I know they don't like this. Lori saw me at Andrews on the healing one Thursday. And next thing we know, they send a gift to the church, and, and they're contacting Dorothy. And um, God has made a relationship. We spend time with them, and, and they have done nothing but bless us. And uh, this is like the third or fourth time we've been together this year, and, and none of it counts yet. So. <laughs> All of you, I could say so much to you, Butch and Julianne, how much, and all of you guys here, Stephen and Rebecca is our, our spiritual son and daughter, and we love them so much. You've all poured into our lives. And Dorothy and I wouldn't be where we're at without you. And Darren sends me notes every week, so what I preach, and he just sends me the notes, and I preach them. And Amen. That's Darren, and so... When I'm up here preaching, just remember Darren sending me his notes. And <laughs> I want to say this about Butch and Julianne. Butch is a very famous guy. You may not know that. We didn't know it until our granddaughter said, Butch Hartman, and our son back there saying, Butch Hartman. <laughs> but Butch and Julianne, as, as, as well as they're known, you two are humble. Amen. Amen. And it's because of your humility that God's going to do greater and greater and greater things for you. And, and he has an ability, just the, the people he connect with in Hollywood and other places, but you don't let that go to your head. Neither one of you do. You let Jesus go to your head. Amen. And they have just so blessed Dorothy and I, uh, everybody, but I, I just, I, I'd have to stop or I'd have to mention everybody in here, and I can, but <laughs> all of you are so amazing. They're so amazing, and their daughters, the proof of their, their daughters are amazing. And all of you young people, our friends, they, this couple here drove all the way up from McAllister. McAllen. McAllen. Just to be here for the conference and be here this morning. These people came from Oklahoma, and, and uh, these, some of you flew out from California. All these kids flew out from Colorado Springs. I mean, <laughs> praise God. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and so, well, I love all of you, and remember this, let your life be hidden with Christ and God. Amen? Amen. All right. Be blessed.